And now turn to your Bible app, or turn to your Bible that's in your hands, and let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We've been talking a lot at the church about what kind of church we want to be, and this is a text that's going to teach us kind of what the church is supposed to look like when it's thriving. And so we're going to land on Ephesians 3.10. I'll read it for you in a second. But we're going to spend our time today kind of bouncing through Ephesians chapter 2.14 through 3.19. Ephesians 3.10 reveals another facet of the mystery of God's will. Paul says this, God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. We're going to spend the next few minutes talking about what that means and why it's so powerful and how that applies to our lives. You know, I know tonight is Halloween. Did you guys know that? How many of you are trick-or-treating tonight? How many of you are handing out candy tonight? How many of you are going to turn off all the lights and pretend like, yeah, okay, wow, come on. Don't do that third one. Don't do that third one. I had a missions professor in seminary say, you know what, I feel like it's ironic that as the church of Jesus, we spend all year long talking about ways to reach our community, except for the one day that our whole community literally knocks on our door And that's the day we turn off the lights, go up to the church, and talk about how sinful our community is. So don't do that. And if you're like, well, that's what I've always done. Let me give you an alternate assignment tonight. Tonight, as Halloween happens in your neighborhood, or in your grandkids' neighborhood, or wherever you end up ending up tonight, I want you to look at this holiday that is not a Christian holiday through the lens that Halloween is a moment in our culture that gives us a glimpse, in part, of what the church is supposed to look like in real life. And here's what I mean. Uh, the same missions professor who told us about Halloween started going on, on this diatribe and, and saying things like, you know what, I feel like Halloween might be one of the more Christian holidays in our calendar. He's like, let me explain. It's like Easter wins. It always wins. It's the resurrection of Jesus. He said, but we know Christmas. Christmas gets commercialized. Christmas becomes very insider, right? It's all about me and my family. It's people don't even go to church on Christmas when it's on Sundays half the time, right? He said, but Halloween, right? And he loved Halloween. Halloween is a holiday that feels like what Christmas should feel like. He said, because it's not just about you and your family. It's about the whole community. And it's not about what you're going to get. It's about going out and giving gifts to anyone. He said, I go to the end of my driveway and I get a little hot chocolate thing and I give out gifts to my neighbors and I build relationships and I realize in that moment just how diverse a community I live in. He says, and on Halloween night, it's like this glimpse of something beautiful where a whole community is formed out of nothing. The people from every background and every tongue, tribe, and nation, they all gather together under one common purpose and just for one night, It's just fun and joy-filled, and we are all one in this one purpose. You know, switch out Halloween for under Christ Jesus, and you get a glimpse of what the church is supposed to look like. A community of people from all over the place, every tongue, tribe, and nation, men, women, right? Every social strata imaginable, all types of people who had no affiliation otherwise, Gather together under Jesus Christ, and in this community, heaven meets earth. And we're in a series called Heaven Meets Earth, and it's based on Ephesians 1.10. Kind of in the theme verse that we're weaving throughout all of Ephesians. And in Ephesians 1.10, Paul makes the claim that under Christ, all things in heaven and on earth are united, are summed up, are brought together, are integrated under his lordship. We talked last week about that's true of us as individuals, that we are God's masterpieces created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. So for us individually, we are these little mini outposts where heaven and earth are united in our own bodies. In Ephesians chapter three, two things happen. One, we move from talking about us as individuals to talking about us Corporately, we talk about in the church, it's a place where heaven meets earth. 
But the second thing that we see happen is that Paul takes this concept of the mystery of the will of God that we talked about in the first week, and he takes it to another level. It's interesting, Paul kind of takes his own journey in account and says, you know what, as an individual, the Apostle Paul, I'm God's masterpiece, I've been created in Christ Jesus for the good works God has prepared in advance for me to do, and Paul says, my plan that God has revealed to me is that I would be someone who brings the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the nations of the world. Paul has called himself throughout the New Testament the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle to the nations, the one who is commissioned as God's masterpiece to walk in these good works of helping people from every tongue, tribe, and nation hear and respond to the message of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, Paul says that as I do this work, And as I start bringing the gospel to folks who are far from God in these various cultures, these various countries, what I'm realizing is that God's overarching plan is richer, more complex, and more beautiful than I ever imagined. And I set the scene, we'll read Paul's words here in Ephesians 3, chapter 6. Paul talks about this mystery that keeps coming out of God's will. He says, this is the mystery This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles, the nations, are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying through this togetherness language and through this unity language, and this idea that I'm not merely going out and reaching individual nations, but I'm forming something bigger is this point that we're gonna massage for this whole sermon time today, and you can write this down. It's that our multi-ethnic church community is a place where heaven meets earth. Our multi-ethnic church community is a place where heaven meets earth. I know some of you, because of your political background or whatever, you're like, why you gotta say multi-ethnic? Why can't you just say, our church community is a place where heaven meets earth, right? If you go to Indonesia and you reach a community of Indonesians and they form an Indonesian church, isn't that a place where heaven meets earth too? Absolutely, absolutely. But as Paul went from nation to nation and people to people and community to community, what he started realizing was that God was doing something bigger than merely reaching individual demographics of nations God's plan was creating a woven tapestry where all of these people were starting to form and weave together into one community called the Church of Jesus Christ. And so the unity in diversity of the church is this new facet of the mystery of the will of God that Paul is waxing eloquent on in Ephesians chapter three. And this is something that Paul talks about more and more as you read through the different letters and watching him doing his missionaries' journeys. You may have heard Galatians 3.28 where he talks about this in a local church assembly. He says, in the church, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And just as the church as a capital C church is comprised of people from every nation of the world, Paul says, in a local small C church, The beauty is that all of us with various backgrounds and identities in this world are woven together into one body called the local church. So if you're nervous about that, don't leave because we're gonna talk about that today. You know, I was remembering the words of Martin Luther King this last week when he talked about that 11 a.m., that's the time of our service, right? 11 a.m. on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in American history. And you know, that was 1963, and yet we're 50 years later, 60 years later. In a lot of ways, that's still true. If you look at the, the makeup of churches around our nation, even though our world is becoming increasingly diverse, by and large, churches are staying pretty homogenous. And so I took the time to, to look up Martin Luther King's full interview on, uh, on Meet the Press in 1963, and he kind of fleshes out a little bit more of what he means by the thing that he said 60 years ago. He says, I think it is one of the tragedies of our nation, one of the shameful tragedies, that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is one of the most segregated hours, if not the most segregated hour in Christian America. 
I definitely think the Christian church should be integrated. And any church that stands against integration and has a segregated body is standing against the spirit and teachings of Jesus Christ and fails to be a true witness. You see, as he shares this, that he's not merely talking about this idea of integration and segregation in the political sphere or in uh, the civil arena, but Martin Luther King is talking about the biblical principle behind the fact that churches Churches should be a place where we are united as one under Christ Jesus. You know, 11 years before Martin Luther King took that interview in 1952, Billy Graham had a a similar experience. This is pre kind of the core of the civil rights movement, 1952, Mississippi, very segregated structurally, and Billy Graham shows up at an arena to do a crusade, and he notices these velvet ropes in in the crowd, and he finds out, well, what is this? It's like, oh, this is the whites section, and this is the section for the African-American folks that are coming out. And he's like, no, I don't do that. And they're like, well, welcome to Mississippi, Dr. Graham. This is what we do down here. It's law, right? And they started to bring in him kind of the political reasons that society should be segregated. And there's different factions. And here, why we believe it's a good, godly thing for folks to be segregated in our world. And he said, hey, bottom line, I'm not doing it. (laughs) If you're gonna have those ropes up, and he said, listen, there may be a place in society where segregation is appropriate. The church of Jesus Christ is not one of those places. I think the theological conviction that Martin Luther King Jr. and Billy Graham shared in these little speeches, micro moments of speeches that they both gave, is the idea that in Christ, ethnic barriers are broken down. Ethnic barriers are broken down in Christ. You know, this is something that as we read Ephesians chapter three, we see the image that I'm assuming was in Billy Graham's mind as he walked into that arena in Mississippi, this football stadium, in verse 14 of chapter two. Talking about Jesus, Paul says, he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And Paul's not talking about velvet ropes at a Billy Graham crusade. Paul is talking about in the temple of the Jewish people where they used to come and worship their God, our God, there was these barriers that existed. There was the court of the Jews, the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, and specifically this wall between Jews and Gentiles. Paul is making the theological argument that because of the ministry of Christ on the other side of the ascension and the missions work of the gospel and folding the Gentiles into the community of faith, that wall that existed for hundreds of years between Jews and Gentiles was crushed. So you imagine Billy Graham showing up at this football stadium and seeing those walls re-erected by Christian people re-segregating the world that Christ had died to integrate, to desegregate. In Christ, the ethnic barriers between us are broken down. You know, it's really easy to talk about Billy Graham and Martin Luther King because they were like 60 years ago. But it gets a little more uncomfortable when we start reading what people are saying today about churches, today about society, today about things like racism and integration and systemic issues and societal issues that plague our world. And we like to do the same thing as people did 60 years ago, bring all of our political opinions to the table. We're not doing that today, right? What we're doing today is we're going back to the scriptures and we're saying, what type of church did Jesus die to create? And we know, all of us know, that Jesus died to create a church where there is no distinction based on anything that people bring to the table, whether it's their race, their their past religion, their gender, right, their identity, whatever they're bringing to the table, we bring this all to Christ and we are formed together into a new type of community. And yet these concepts in real life are, are often really hard. And and so I just want to dignify, here are the two reasons that I see that these concepts that we're going to talk about today are hard in real life. And and the first one, you can write this down, you're probably going to remember it, is that there's something in us that wants to separate from people who are unlike us. There's just something in us that wants to separate from people who are unlike us, right? Whether it's that emotion you feel when someone different than you is talking in a way that makes you know, gets you mad at the grocery store or cuts you off, right? Or the way that you just feel like there's this 
hatred you have in your heart towards this or that type of people, right? Whether we're talking about race, we're talking about people's life, we're talking about people's economic status, we're talking about people's gender, we're talking about their sexual or gender identity, right? There's something in us that just has this uh, towards certain groups of people, and it's probably different for each of us, right? That are unlike us, that we've just decided, I wanna distance myself from that type of person. Right, this is the thing in us that causes thoughts and behavior that, that's racist, thoughts and behavior that bigoted, even this idea of, of nationalism. My country is better than your country. My nation is better than your nation. My race is better than your race. My language is better than your language, right? My identity is better than your identity. My gender is better than your gender. There's something in us that, that wants to separate, right? And if you've been someone who's been trying to get better at being a human over the last five years or 50 years of your life, Chances are one of the areas you've tried to get better is growing in love for people who are unlike you, whether it's the folks who live on the streets or whatever it is, right? Someone who's unlike you, but there's something in us that wants to distance ourselves from people who are unlike us. You could probably guess the second one. There's a second issue, and that there is, is that this, is that there is something in us that wants to affiliate, that wants to gravitate towards people who are like us. There's just something in us that does that. This is a sociological factor called the homogeneous unit principle. Have you ever heard of this? If you're talking about milk, it's homogeneous. If you're talking about people, it's homogeneous. I'm not really sure. The homogeneous unit principle. Here's the homogeneous unit principle. People like to gravitate towards people who are very similar to themselves. This is a concept that was used in church planting in the 70s and 80s. Churches, big old churches that founded by saying, you know what, we should leverage this. Right? People love people just like them. Let's create churches for people just like you. Right? You like coffee? Let's create a Starbucks church. Right? Are you like that kind of music? Let's create a jazz service just for you. Right? Oh, what? You only like being a manly man? We're going to create manly men church. Right? Oh, you only like this race? Let's create this type of church. Right? The homogeneous unit principle was used by church leaders to create churches because they wanted to attract people to the gospel. And they said, you know what? Let's just be honest. People don't like folks who are different than them. People love hearing, having conversations and getting into relationship with people who are just like them. We should just start churches that are very homogenous as they start. It works, but the type of churches that can easily be created if you build churches on these models are churches very dissimilar to the way that the church is described in the scripture. This is one of the reasons as a a church for the last 25 years, we've always talked about, we're not gonna be that church that does like an old folk service and a young folk service and all these different things, right? Because we wanna be a church where we're one in Christ Jesus. We have a hard time, even a lot of our ministries, we create ministries like this on purpose, a young families class, a women's ministry, a men's ministry, right? But at the same time, as we build these things and have these conversations, We struggle because it's really easy if you build a church for different demographics to become a church that divided over every demographic and the church doesn't end up reflecting the unity and diversity and integration between the segments of the body of Christ that's supposed to be one in Christ Jesus. In that interview um, with Martin Luther King in 1963, he said, you know what? He said, our church, he said, it's a predominantly African-American church. He said, it's, it's a segregated church. It's not a segregating church. We're not kicking white people out, but it's still a segregated church in the sense that we've got work to do to be an integrated church, right? So there's a, a place in our church too, right? We're not a segregating church. We're not gonna kick you out because you're this or that or whatever, right? But there are aspects of our church. There are expe- aspects maybe of your small group or your, as- or your involvement in our church that is segregated for other folks in the body. So some of the questions that we need to start asking is how do we get rid of this sin that tends to plague us? How do we actively unweave ourselves from our proclivities and pursue this vision that Paul gives us and that Christ gives us of a church that's truly united and integrated at every level? We get a bit of the answer here in the text, and this is a long one to write down. I'm sorry, but you can write this down. Uh, The barriers between us will only break down when we truly believe our common identity in Christ is greater and higher than all other identities. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having a women's ministry or a men's ministry. 
right, or a young families class, or a seniors community. I'm not even saying there's anything wrong with having a traditional service and a contemporary service, or like an experimental service, whatever, right, but great. But we just gotta realize that when we start clinging to those forms or only hovering with those people, something starts to break and get formed or reinforced in our lives that's supposed to be deconstructed in Christ Jesus. And we're only gonna make progress in becoming humans that weave ourselves within the fabric of the church with other humans when we ensure that our identity in Christ is greater and higher than any other identity uh, that you name yourself by. Now this is uh, something that Paul brings out. I think this is in verse, what, 15? Yeah, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. You see this idea of multiple groups and Jews and Gentiles, these two groups becoming one, but becoming one in Christ Jesus because of the gospel. And so I am not committing that we are gonna be a church that you never have a class that's just people like you, right? That's part of life. Part of life is connecting people in your life stage, right? We get that. But what we are committing is that we are not going to let our church become a place where our identities that we bring to the table trump the common identity that God has given us as children of God because of his gospel. And so this is why, you know, a lot of people are like, well, hey, why are we changing this? Why are we changing that? We are always putting everything through the metrics of the scripture. And sometimes we realize, okay, we're a little too heavy on the segregation. We gotta move towards integration, right? This is one of those seasons in our church life. We're like, you know what? If we're gonna do communities that are homogenous, let's do a bunch of them and let's do some catch-alls and let's do them all on Wednesday night. Right, so anyone can come to Three Crosses You. Young families are at the families class. Spanish speakers are at the Spanish class. Women are at the women's study, right? But there are different groups happening all at the same time. Let's unite over dinner before we separate. And even if we're gonna separate, let's make sure some of the groups can have a lot of different people in it because we're trying to walk the line. If we get it, if you're a woman, you're trying to connect with other women, that happens. But we wanna do this in a way that doesn't reinforce either the sin nature we bring to the table or the unhealthy proclivity we bring to the table. We wanna find a way to allow us to connect with like lifestyled people, but in a way that integrates us as one under Christ Jesus because of the gospel. It's a dance, it's a moving target, we're gonna make a lot of mistakes, but it's a dance that we get from the scriptures of we are, we are coming together as one under Christ Jesus. And so the question I wanna ask you, right? We don't, I don't wanna just talk about the church, let's talk about you. The question I wanna ask you is this, we'll put it on the screen. Do you truly believe that your Christian identity is greater and higher than any other identity you claim? Yep, yep, amen. I saw a woman on the news one time and she said, listen, she named her political party. I, I'm a Republican or a Democrat first and I'm a Christian second. It's like, oh, no, 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 right? Most of us know you're not supposed to say that out loud. That's why I said, but do you truly believe it, right? I don't care what you say out loud. Do you act and live in that way? Is your Christian identity greater and higher than your financial identity? Is your Christian identity greater or higher than your gender identity? Is your Christian identity greater or higher than your sexual identity or your racial identity or your handedness or your Enneagram number, right? Whatever it is. Your introvert, extrovert, your Myers-Briggs, your socioeconomic status, Cal or Stanford. (laughs) Is your Christian identity greater and higher than any other identity you bring to the table, right? And I realize, I just named a spectrum of identities. Who cares what college you go to, right? This type of identity is immutable or whatever. Like, you can't change your ethnicity or your national origin or your language of origin, whatever. I get it. But is your identity in Jesus Christ greater and higher than all other identities? Now, this is something that Paul wrestled with and grew in, it seems, as he wrestled with and grew in his own calling. Because you watch him as he goes on these missionary journeys, and he starts just kind of, he starts in the Jewish areas, and he starts to move beyond it, and have these like light bulbs, like, whoa, the Gentiles are Christians now. 
Like, whoa, the Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit now. Like, whoa, what are we gonna do with all these Gentiles, right? Do we need to make them act like Jewish people? Then they go back to Jerusalem, they wrestle with it, and they go, no, right? And they wrestling with what it means that the church is becoming comprised of people from all of these different places. And by the time we get to Acts chapter 13, it starts to feel like the church is forming into what God is intending it to be. And a lot of things happen when the gospel roots itself in a city called Antioch in Acts chapter 13. You read in the, in the Acts text that Christians, or that the church is called, the people of God are first called Christians in the city of Antioch. That this is a place where the identity of God's people has changed enough from its roots in Judaism that they got their own religious name at this point. Something's different about the church now where now they have their own unique identity under Christ. And so they're called Christians, little Christs, Christians. And we see in Acts chapter 13, verse one, just a glimpse into what makes this church unique. You know, we'll put it up on the screen. It says that in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, and it names four of them. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had brought it, been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, so the fifth, Saul. And, and what we see in this list is that even though this were, these were like the elders, the leaders, the prophets, the teachers in the church in the city of Antioch, it's a leadership that is comprised from men all around the world. Right? We, we see Saul and Barnabas, who both are of Jewish origin. Saul was a Pharisee from Tarsus. Barnabas uh, was from Crete, I think, or Cyrene, something like that. Uh, and so two different regional Jewish folks with different Jewish backgrounds. But at the same time, you've got this guy, Menaean. Menaean is noted in this text as someone who grew up with Herod the Tetrarch. And so he's kind of geeking out a little bit. I'm like, this guy didn't grow up Jewish. This guy grew up as a, a Roman political family figure in the midst of God's people. He was our enemy, and now he's one of our leaders. Right? Then these other two guys are described by their ethnic and national identity. Right? You've got Simeon, who folks called Niger. Most likely uh, Niger, like Nigeria, either he was from Nigeria or just known for his dark complexion. So a dark-skinned African man named Simeon from this place in Africa. We've also got this guy Lucius from Libya, Cyrene, a town in, in modern day Libya. And so we have these African leaders, we have this different political background, grew up as a Roman in Israel type person, we have these two Jewish folks and integrated together, they form the leadership of the church at Antioch. Antioch is also the place where they start to have some drama in the church for the first time. This is Peter, he comes up from Jerusalem. Peter is known as the apostle to the Jewish folks. Paul is known as the apostle to the Gentiles, right? So boom, so Peter shows up in Antioch and he starts getting a little uncomfortable. Right, now let's go back to the Billy Graham crusade. Now let's go back to Martin Luther King era. He starts getting a little uncomfortable because he looks around the cafeteria of the church and all the Jewish and Gentile folks are integrating together even around the table. And he's like, dietary laws, Jewish stuff, red flags, buzzers in his head. He's like, this has to change, right? And so he starts gathering the Jewish folks and starts gravitating them back together to a table. And Paul says in Galatians, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to the face because he was clearly in the wrong. And they start saying, before he came, he used to eat with certain people and then even blah, blah, blah right? And, and then he says at the end of his little rambling speech, he says this powerful phrase, he says, when I saw that he was not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said in front of them all, and then he reads in the right act, when he was not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, for Paul, looking at a multi-ethnic church community was not merely a really cool idea, had nothing to do with being a woke Christian. A multi-ethnic church community was core and central to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because what Christ did on the cross was that he broke down every wall, the wall between us and God, the wall between us and each other, the wall between the rich and the poor, the wall between the blacks and the whites, the wall between all people in society and formed in them, took away the animosity, took away the hostility, and formed out of all of these diverse people one new creation called the Church of Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's a worthy goal for, uh, for, for you, for me, for our church to run after. It, it's a goal like we see with Paul and Peter and Antioch that has an easy kind of snapback factor where we try it for a while and we get sucked back into our homogenous communities. And so I just wanna warn you as you begin to kind of dabble in this in your own life that everything in you 
will fight against living life in a diverse community. Everything in you. All right, if this goes a pathway you want to go down, right? Some of you, your families are going to fight against you. I've talked to folks. I talked to a guy a few months ago who grew up, I mean, whose family came from Japan. He married a woman who came from another Southeast Asian country, and his parents were like, what? His own family fighting against living life, living a marriage in a diverse community. Now, personally, there might be some sin in your life that fights, again, building relationships with people who are unlike you. There might be some really practical things, right? You think, man, I want to build relationships with my neighbors. They came from this other country, but I know they're Christian folks, whatever, great. And you start to sit down and you realize the language barrier makes it difficult for you to exist in, in a multi-ethnic community. Some of you, just silly things, right? Like cultural things will make it hard for you to connect. They go to bed super late. You go to bed at 7.30 because you're a good Christian person, right? I don't know. Every time you invite your neighbors to come over for dinner, they bring their kids with them. Like, come on! Right? Or every time you ask your neighbors to go out to dinner with you, they leave their kids at home. Like, what kind of parents leaves their kids at home with a babysitter, right? Cultural things. Right? One person might say, I can't believe these Christian people call themselves Christians, but they don't value their own children enough to bring them to dinner. Right? Your other person might say, no, I can't believe these people don't value their marriage enough to get away from their children from time to time. Right? Everything in you. Right? There's systemic structural things in your life. Where I, I believe that our lives, because of the sin within us, because of our desire to be with people like us, all these aspects in our lives a lot of times can become kind of like these fine-tuned machines that just output homogeneous community. And, and it's just it's, it's so hard to break away from that. But that happens in the church too. I, I remember probably 15 years ago now, we, we were talking about diversity in, in the body of our church. And we've always said diversity is a sign of health because we just want to preach the gospel, and we don't care who's coming, we just want them to hear and respond, right? But at the same time, if only a certain type of people are responding, it's like, are we preaching the gospel just for this one type of person, right? And so we said, how diverse is our church? And we look out, we're like, it's actually pretty diverse. Our church is reflecting our community outside our doors more and more. That's a sign of health, right? And then we looked at our leadership. And we're like, man, all of our pastors are white. Most of our staff is white. All of our elders are white. I know we didn't do that on purpose, but what gives? Right, so I said, okay, well, let's not overthink it, right? These things take time. We disciple people into places of leadership and authority in the next couple years. I'm sure as these folks from a diverse community come and get discipled in our church, our leadership's gonna reflect our community. So fast forward a couple years, no change. Like, okay, I know we're not doing this on purpose. What's happening? Right, so we start to dig a little bit. We go to our youth ministry where we do all these internships where these kids eventually grow up in ministry and then they get jobs at the church as pastors when they feel called to ministry, that kind of thing. And so we look at our internship program. We're like, well, let's talk to some of the kids in the youth group that we feel like God is working on their lives and say, you should join the, the internship program. How come, how come only white kids are joining the internship program? And I'll never forget this conversation. We went and talked to the, this, this kid in our youth group who was not a white kid and said, hey, we really see something amazing in, that God is doing in you. You should sign up to be an intern. He's like, no thanks. Like, what are you talking about? Like, we feel like you could be a pastor. He's like, I don't want to be a pastor. I'm like, why not? He said, you know that's a white person job, right? <laughs> like, what do you mean it's a white person job? He's like, have you seen our pastors? I'm like, yeah, 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 but I mean, anybody can be a pastor. He's like, it's, I'm like, oh, no, right? And so then we started talking about some of the, the systems that we have here at the church. How do we break through that? How do we become a church where it's not just everyone's welcome in here, but only some people up here? But how do we have some hard conversations to break down those walls of hostility we don't even know exist sometimes? Because the truth is that when we start to value this in our own lives and in our church, everything in us, even the invisible things, will war against this good work that God wants to do. Right, so some of us have the question in our minds, if this is so hard, why should we do it? <laughs> right? Aren't there most, more important things to the gospel, like preaching the gospel? <sighs> and the answer to that question is found here in the text of Scripture. And I want you to write this down or take a picture of this because this is where it lands in Ephesians 3.10. Paul teaches us that the diversity of the church proclaims the glory and purpose of God to every entity on heaven, and in heaven and earth. I'll say it again. The diversity of the church <laughs> proclaims the glory and purpose of God to every entity in heaven and on earth. 
this is, this is Ephesians chapter three, verse 10. This is kind of the core verse. We saw Ephesians 1, 10, 2, 10. It's just a coincidence, but now it's 3, 10. Paul says about God, he says, his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. The manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Right, you're like, wait, how does this have to do with diversity? I'll tell you. The word manifold, right? If you're a car person, you're like, oh, like an exhaust or intake manifold. Kind of, right? A manifold in a car, I'm not a car person, right? Takes a bunch of different sources and outputs them into one thing. So manifold wisdom is God has a bunch of wisdom and it outputs in one thing. Okay. Right. The way that the word manifold was used in, in Greek times was a lot of times to describe an interwoven tapestry. Right, we have this one piece of fabric or this one garment that's coming together, but it's weaving together all these different colors, weaving together, almost like a quilt, all these different pieces to form this one thing. And so Paul is using the word manifold to link into the mystery of the word of God to say, when the church is comprised of people woven together from every background and nation and color and all these different things woven together, the manifold wisdom, the multicolored wisdom, the tapestry of wisdom of God is made known. Right, how, what is manifold wisdom, right? That, let's think about the gospel. The gospel is an example of how the manifold wisdom of God is made known because we know that God is infinitely wise and we know that in his wisdom, God had a plan since before the creation of the world. We know that in his wisdom, God had a plan to redeem this broken world. We know that there are issues in that wisdom related to human sin and suffering. There's issues that we need to learn about the nature and character of God. We know there's a sin problem that needs to be atoned for. We know there's a death problem that needs to be solved. We know there is life that we need. We know the spirit needs to do a a mighty work. We know that we've never seen God face to face and he needs to solve that in some way. We know there is a thousand problems in the world and we have no idea how all those problems will be solved at the same time. But in the gospel, of Jesus Christ, a billion different things all converge and shine forth a truth that gives answers to every question in human existence. The gospel is an an opportunity for us to see the manifold wisdom of God, the multicolored, the tapestry, almost like the facets of a diamond brilliantly shining forth all of God's wisdom in one thing. Paul says in the same way, when the church is comprised of people from all backgrounds and tongues and nations, and together they unite under Christ and love one another deeply, in this church, this one body, the manifold wisdom of God shines forth because through all of our uniqueness, the wisdom of God emerges and the world sees it. You know, you can look out at Halloween and see a beautiful event and be touched by it and see the Christian implications of that and the community. But when the church acts like the church, when the church is comprised of all different folks, when the church comes together and submits to one another, when they humble themselves in front of each other, the world sees a picture of the glory and wisdom of God like it can nowhere else on planet Earth. You know, I think one of the hardest things with this whole race and diversity conversation these last few, week, these last few years is that a lot of times it feels like that's relegated to the political realm or that's relegated to the social realm or the structural realm or to the legislative realm or whatever, the social world. And it doesn't, shouldn't involve the church. But even when Martin Luther King was talking in that interview about about the problems that plague even the church and segregation and integration and making his church even more diverse, Martin Luther King said this. He says, this is something the church will have to do itself. I don't think church integration will come through legal processes. You can't just wait for the world to solve our diversity issues. You can't wait for the politicians to make our church more diverse or integrated or beautiful. We gotta do this. We gotta be a church that loves one another deeply, that weaves ourselves with other people and shows the world the glory and beauty and diversity of our God by coming together intentionally as God's people. So if you're tracking with me, I'm gonna give you four things to do and a principle to live by. If you're not tracking with me, here's your homework. Listen to the sermon again and then track with me next time. So here are the four things for you to do. Number one, if you want to make progress in this field, evaluate your social circles. Look at your speed dial. You're like, oh, my speed dial is real diverse. Okay, now look at your missed calls and your outgoing calls, right? Look at the people sending you messages on Instagram. Look at your feed, right? 
Look at the people you hang out with on Halloween. Look at your small group. Look at the people you gravitate towards when you come to church family dinner, right? Evaluate your social circles. Take a long and loving, grace-filled look at the people that are woven into the fabric of your life. Right? Don't, I'm not saying you're like, okay, do I know an Asian person? Do I know a white person? Not like that. <laughs> Evaluate your social circles. Who are the five closest people in your life? Do they reflect the beauty and diversity of the church of Jesus Christ? Evaluate. Number two, repent of any sin that's within you. And there's gonna be a chance that even right now, you're like not listening to me because there's sin in you. you. You love people like you. You hate people, whatever it is, or it's a lighter version of that, whatever it is. Maybe your politics is making it so you can't hear the Bible, right? Whatever it is, evaluate, evaluate the sin within you. Release that to the Lord. Then go evaluate your social circles. Then come back, right? Repent of the sin that's within you. Third, this is the hard one, intentionally develop multi-ethnic Christian community. Right, don't, don't be one of those people that's like, oh, cool, my church is diverse, so I can hang out with all the people just like me in my small group, right? Intentionally create and cultivate for yourself, for your family, for your kids, multi-ethnic Christian community. There's a lot of reasons to do that. We could talk about that actually next week, but intentionally cultivate it, right? And you're like, I don't know how to do that, right? Go find someone that you do trust and ask them. Right? And don't do the thing where you're like, okay, I'm gonna add like one white person to my small group. And it's the I'm gonna add one Asian person, or I'm gonna add a poor person, or I have a homeless person in my small group. Like, that's weird. Don't do that, right? <laughs> Part of this is just reimagining your life from the ground up, right? So maybe it is. Okay, I've not been in a small group since COVID. When we j- launch back into a small group, I'm just gonna invite folks from all different walks of life. And I wanna make sure that my small group reflects the beauty and diversity of the Church of Jesus. Right, and so I wanna make sure there's a single mom in my small group, and there's somebody who's living under the poverty line in, the small gr- in my small group, and there's a rich person, and an educated person, and an uneducated person, right? People from different nations, people who speak different languages, right? I'm just gonna do what we learned in the last series, Pastor Buzz's message, I think it was week two, right? I'm gonna go to the highways and byways and invite any type of person who wants to come, and I'm gonna start from the ground up building a diverse community in my life. All right, maybe you don't need to start from scratch. Maybe you just show up at something. Come to our family dinner on Wednesday night and go sit with people you don't normally sit with. Right? Invite someone who lives in your neighborhood who's from a different country than you to come up and experience Christmas with your crosses. Right? Just find ways to start weaving folks into your life, not at a tokenism level, but at a life-on-life, real friendship community level. Someone is praying for you. You're praying for them. This is very hard See the reasons I mentioned earlier, but intentionally cultivate Christian, multi-ethnic Christian community in your life. And then the fourth, we get this from Paul and Peter fighting in Antioch, fight hard to keep what God is creating. There's a huge snapback factor in this whole thing, right? You'll have a great small group, and then it kind of fizzles, and the next time, your life is more homogenous than ever before. It just happens, right? So realize this is one of the things that Christ died to break down these walls. And so until it becomes part of the culture of our church, until it becomes part of the culture of your life, we're gonna get sucked back into the culture of our life yesterday. So fight hard. Make this a priority as you live life with Christ in this next season. Now the principle to live by that, that I, I wanna kind of bring forth is help us launch into next week. And so we'll end with here, I'll, I'll read a text. But let's humble ourselves, bring our diverse selves to the table, and become formed together. Humble ourselves, bring our diverse selves to the table, and become formed together. This is about submission. This is about humility. This is about saying, God, I pray that you would form us into a community that looks like your bride, and you would form me into a person who looks like your son or daughter. And it's gonna take all of us to form into the diverse manifold brilliance of Jesus Christ together. I'm gonna to close by reading these last few verses in Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Paul says, as he kind of, asked, after he explains this vision, he says, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, right? A reminder that we all have the same last name because we have the same Father. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I want to pray for us, and then let's take communion together.